Full Metal Jacket by Stanley Kubrick is, on its face, a great film. It's got action, drama, comedy. It's a great movie just to sit and watch for your very first time. But with Stanley Kubrick's films, there is always a deeper layer underneath the superficial surface of it all. Kubrick doesn't just give away the deeper meanings of his films easily, but he does give a few hints in the film, because Kubrick films aren't supposed to be analyzed in chronological order. Analyzing this movie on a deeper level actually starts three quarters of the way through the film. When Private Joker and Rafter Man go to the mass grave and take pictures of all the dead Viet Cong and run into the commanding officer. The commanding officer heckles Joker about having a peace symbol on his jacket while also having the words born to kill written on his helmet. And he asks him about why is he contradicting himself. Joker initially doesn't want to respond, but the commanding officer tells him that if he doesn't tell him the reason, he's going to make his world shit. And so Joker tells him that it He is referencing the duality of man, the Jungian thing, as he says, basically stating that there are two conflicting sides to a single person. And I think this is the entry point to the whole film. Before we get too far into the analysis, if you wouldn't mind liking the video and subscribing to the channel and considering supporting me on Patreon, it would go a long way to helping me make more of these videos. Thank you. Kubrick films are definitely not supposed to be analyzed top to bottom, left to right. They are puzzles in and of themselves. And so now that we've been given this little tidbit of information three quarters of the way through the film, you then can go back and rewatch the movie through a new lens. And the film centers around duality. Dual meaning two. The structure of the film is broken up into two acts, each with their own climax, each with their own storyline. The only through line between the two is that Joker and Cowboy are involved. When Joker mentions the Jungian thing, the duality of man, he is referring to Carl Jung, the philosopher and psychoanalyst. One of Jung's main concepts that he developed is the concept of a person's shadow, which is basically their inner self. So then someone has their the person that they present to the outside world, and they also have the shadow inside of them, which is their deeper subconscious, basically. And this film, not only is it about the duality of someone's identity, it is also just about someone's identity in and of itself. A lot of the film is spent talking about what you are going to be, who you're going to become, who you are supposed to act like. The film very poignantly starts with the buzzing of all of the recruits' hair, taking their hairstyles all down to buzz cuts. And that is basically what happens during basic training is it is the the process of them losing their personal identity to some extent and having a new identity put onto them by the Marine Corps. And it is somewhat personalized with the sergeant giving everyone their fun nickname, whether it's Snowball or Joker or Pile or Cowboy but it is the process of breaking down their previous identity and creating a new identity, creating dual identities, their own duality in and of itself. The sergeant, his duality is that he, on the surface, is tough, is mean, is trying to beat up the recruits, basically, but also his shadow is at the heart of it all. He does care about his recruits. He wants them to live. He wants them to be able to survive the war, and he wants them to be able to succeed. And so that's why he is giving them such tough love. He plays the game of being tough on them to prepare them for the war, but also showing them kindness through the jokes. And even in that, he teaches a lesson that he teaches to Private Pyle at the beginning. Private Pyle can't stop laughing at the jokes that the sergeant is telling them while also being mean to everybody. And the sergeant knows that what he's doing is a joke to some extent. It's mean and hardening and a joke all at the same time. He wants the recruits to enjoy the joke, but not show emotion of it. He wants them to be able to enjoy it, but also take the lesson from it, take the pain from what he's giving them. And so that's why he takes so seriously that Private Pyle needs to stop smiling. He needs to teach you the lesson that you act without showing the emotions that you're having. The duality of Joker is he is someone who is a capable soldier. He's able to follow the rules. He's able to do what the sergeant is asking. He's able to kill. He's able to shoot. He's able to do all the things that are required of him. But he is he is very much strict about trying to keep his identity separate from his soldier identity. He can see the world and society around him. 
and sees what the sergeant is trying to do. The sergeant is trying to break people down, break their identity down, and then remold them into the Marines. And that comes into conflict throughout his his time in the Marines, whether it's beating up Private Pyle. Like, all the other Marines have no problem beating up Pyle because Pyle makes their lives hell being a Marine. But Joker has regrets about beating up Private Pyle because his pre-Marine identity doesn't want to just naturally hurt someone. And there's a few pieces of duality that happen during the training when the sergeant is highlighting Whitman and Oswald who were trained Marines who then took their training and used it for horrible things like shooting people at the University of Texas or killing Kennedy. And at the end of their training, Joker makes a statement of the Marine Corps doesn't want robots. They want indestructible killers without fear. That statement shows that Joker isn't impervious to the machine that he is trying to critique. Every point in that sentence is false. Basically, the system does want robots. They want killing machines, as what the sergeant says. He wants them to be indestructible. And while the sergeant says that Marines aren't allowed to die without permission, plenty of Marines are going to die and to be killers without fear. That is also inherently not the case. All these soldiers experience fear one way or the other. To some extent, even Private Joker has drank in the Kool-Aid. He is part of the machine to some extent, even if he tries to sort of keep his identity as separate as possible so he's able to critique and have an ironic distance to everything. That's why he puts on his John Wayne voice, is because he's trying to have an ironic distance to everything that he's having to do. And that can only go so far, though, because you can have an ironic distance to things, but when it comes to eventually killing people, being in the war, at some point that ironic distance melts away. It can't stand up to the disturbing nature of what you're being forced to engage with. And so after the climax of the first act of Private Pyle killing the sergeant, Private Joker is sent off to Vietnam to work in the journalism division, doing stories about Vietnam, to report about how well the war is going and how we're winning the war in the hearts and minds of others. And soon he realizes how much that is just full of shit. Joker is just working for the propaganda division of the military, but he can still have an ironic distance to it all. He still can have fun while in Vietnam. It's not explicitly shown, but it's probably pretty obvious that Joker would have been a Marine taking drugs like many did during Vietnam. He's obviously not against having sex with prostitutes, which is what happens in the first scene of him in Vietnam. So he's able to have an ironic distance to his job, to being at war, and to being part of the propaganda wing of this machine that is killing people and causing so much destruction. Until the Tet Offensive happens and he is thrown into the shit where he has to go and meet back up with Cowboy and actually go into the fighting with him. One soldier who really stands out when Joker meets up with Cowboy again in his platoon is he meets Animal Mother. Animal Mother is, I think, the exception of the duality of man in this film. Animal Mother does not seem to have a Jungian shadow, as we've discussed in all these other characters. He has decided to embrace his role in the killing machine. He is not killing for freedom, like others have stated. He's not fighting for his country. He's not fighting for justice, for the freedom of the Vietnam. All the reasons that the propaganda wing of the military is trying to say why we're there in Vietnam. Animal Mother is there to kill because he is part of this machine, and that is what he's been designed to do is he's been designed to kill. As he says, he's not killing for freedom, he's not killing for his country, he's killing for Poon Tang. And I think he is the exception to the rule of everyone having their young Yin shadow. And I can't really fault him for what he's had to go through. He's had to just murder people. As they've said, he's a great killer in the field. His helmet says, I am become death, which is quoting the Bhagavad Gita and quote from Shiva, the destroyer of worlds. There's an ironicness to that as well, but also there is, I think, a level of spirituality that is true to him, where being Shiva, that is, in Hinduism, being true to yourself and being true to your destiny is very important, and he's embraced that. He's embraced his role and the part he plays in the universe of being the destroyer. He doesn't have qualms about what he's being asked to do, because this is his role to play, and he's going to play it to the best of his abilities. And to some extent, you could say that he is the most enlightened person of everyone in the platoon and anyone else in the movie. He's not lying to himself about how the war is going so great, that what he's being forced to do is noble and just, when in reality it is disturbing and 
gruesome. He embraces it and realizes that this is the role he plays in the universe and he should take pride in the fact that he is executing his role so well. And the film climaxes with the platoon running into a sniper. Eight Ball and Dr. J are taken down, and in an attempt to get to the sniper, Cowboy is also shot. And the big twist at the end of the film, once they're able to get to the sniper, that the sniper isn't some hardened male warrior that they're thinking that they're fighting against. Three of the Marines have been killed by a Vietnamese teenage girl. I think that on multiple levels that is a big twist because A, it takes down the male machismo that the whole film is perpetrating throughout itself. It's a critique of masculinity in war. There's no masculine pride in being part of the war. Another point that this twist brings up, the mechanisms and operations of war itself are so simple to operate that a teenage girl can operate it. And that is something that has only evolved through time, as, as we know today, where in the Iraq and Afghanistan war, there's female and children suicide bombers. In war, a child or a woman can be just as successful at killing as a man who's been trained and a hardened killer, as they say. And in the big climax, there is that final moment between the teenage girl with the AK-47 and Joker. This shows the duality of Joker and that he doesn't actually have the hardened heart that the sergeant is talking about because he flinches in the moment and he's about to be killed until his partner, Rafterman, steps in and is able to shoot the, the sniper before he's shot. But while Joker is not able to kill in the moment, he's able to at least have the mercy to kill the teenage girl once she's shot and bled out and dying. And so at the end, what are we really sort of left to think about with Full Metal Jacket? And I think all of this sort of analysis of the duality of individuals, we realize that there's a duality to the society we live in. There's a contradiction to this American war machine that these guys are being forced to be a part of, becoming murder machines. And then very ironically at the end, they're singing the Mickey Mouse Club song. And Joker acknowledges that he's grateful that he's alive and that he survived this encounter. But he acknowledges that he's already, just like Private Pile, living in a world of shit. He's, in some sense, dead before he's even been killed. There's a ironic duality to these soldiers, these murder machines, as they call themselves, singing the Mickey Mouse Club. They have become part of this machine that accepts the fact that people can't be animal mother. Not everyone can just be animal mother. You have to have you have to let people have their own identity. Does that make things any better? Is Joker's position any better than animal mothers? And it's not. We just live in this postmodern world where you still have to do the horrible thing, but at least you have your ironic distance to doing the horrible thing that you're forced to do. And I think that's a question and a contradiction that we're left with in the film, and we have to grapple with, of is that something that we're okay with in this system, and why the message at the end of the film is inherently anti-war, because this isn't right and shouldn't have happened. Well, thanks for listening to my analysis on Full Metal Jacket by Stanley Kubrick. If you like this analysis, it'd be great if you could like the video and subscribe to the channel and consider supporting me on Patreon. It goes a long way to helping me make more of these videos. Thanks again. See you next time.